afternoon. This is Dr. Scott at the Air Zoo in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Today I would like to talk to you about the Grumman Mallard. Now, first of all, uh, Grumman has made several amphibious aircraft, and it seems like each one of them uh, are named after an amphibious bird. Like one of the, the first ones that they built was the uh, Grumman Duck, which didn't even look like uh, this type of aircraft here. But uh, secondly was the, the Widgeon, which was a, a little bit bigger, but it was more shaped like this airplane here with the boat hull and the pontoons. Then came the Goose, which was a little bit bigger than the Widgeon, and this is our Mallard. And after the Mallard is the, uh, uh, the Albatross. And the, it seems the Air Force really liked the Albert, or the uh, Coast Guard really liked the Albatross, and they used it a lot for search and rescue. They could land on the water and pick up people so much easier. As an amphibian, you'll notice the, the boat hull on the nose here. And uh, there's little um, flarings on each side here, which keeps the water off the, the propellers, off the, the engine and such. And then it has the the nose landing gear on it. There's the tow bar position up in there. The, uh, when the, the landing gear is in the up position and the door is closed, then it makes a real smooth and nice looking uh, hull on this thing. Most airplanes don't have this tie down up here. Uh, quite often when this is be landed on the, the water and taxi up to the dock, and it can, becomes a boat, actually. And this is the way they tie it down to the dock, just like they would any other kind of boat. As we come along the right side, you notice the, the nose is quite long here. Well, the instrument panel is right about here. And underneath and behind the instrument panel, this whole nose is opened up. And there's cargo can be stored in here. And we'll take a look at that when we get inside. These windows are quite and I say actually crank open like they did in the old cars so that you can get a breeze while flying along. And it was, it's really an interesting, uh, fun time. The landing gear, the main landing gear on this is, is quite interesting too. Because the way it folds up, this will go up and into there, which will bend the gear, and this will fold up into here. And you see how the, uh, the, the door covers will fit right into that so neatly. And then when the gear is up, then this thing is a, either a flying machine or a boat. And when in the water, the water level will be right about at this height. Right behind us, we have the engine. This is a Pratt & Whitney engine, 600 horsepower. And uh, it's a uh, variable pitch propeller that's controlled by the pilot inside. As we come along here, this, this is the wing, and uh, an interesting part about this wing is that it's what we call uh, a wet wing. And instead of having a gas tank stuck in there, which is very heavy and uh, can cause a lot of extra weight, the inside of the wing would be coated with a, uh, a sealant. And then the whole wing up, up about uh, here was filled with the fuel and it would just take care of the, uh, the weight and the flow of fuel. You notice there's cow flaps that are open underneath the engine. When idling or when taxiing along, uh, the engine can get quite warm. So in order to get the air to go through the engine, they would open up these flaps underneath here and the air could go right on through the engine and out through there. The wingspan of this aircraft is 66 feet, seven inches, which gives it a lot of lift. Of course, this aircraft was built in the, uh, I think it was 1946 is when the first one flew, the, the prototype. So the long, narrow wings was kind of the, the thing at that time. This aircraft here came out of the factory in 1949 and went into service from there. This is a float. When the aircraft is in the water, of course, one wing is going to go down into the water. I, I don't care how you... you uh, try to balance it. But this float here would keep the, this wing, as well, another float on the other side, and keep that one out of the water. Sometimes these floats would be used as an extra fuel tank. And there's a place right over here where a fuel cap could have been put on so that you could refuel here 
I forget how many gallons, I think it's like 35, 40 gallons could be put into the float. And fuel floats on water, so it, it didn't change the, uh, the float's job. As we come back here, you can see underneath here we have what's called the step. The, the, no, or the boat part or the hull part of the aircraft comes from the nose back to the step here. And uh, then we have just the uh, water support back here for slow uh, taxing on the water. The, when taking off of this aircraft, the, the first thing we have to do is get it up onto the step and then the, the plane will pretty much take itself off. The tail section is almost as big as the, a lot of small private airplanes now. Uh, there are no types of uh, anti-icing equipment on this aircraft, but uh, they were hardly ever flown in um, cold areas. One of the reasons for the building this aircraft, because there were in the 40s and the 50s, there were a lot of airport or a lot of cities along the seashore that did not have any kind of airport, so they could be serviced by this type of aircraft. Now I've spent time in the Grumman Goose, and one thing I liked about the Goose was in the tail underneath here, we had a rudder that could be put down, and it's called a water rudder, and it made it easier for uh, uh, maneuvering on the water. This aircraft here, the, about the only way you could steer this on the water is by what we call concentric um, thrust, where we could either uh, speed up the, the left engine and that'll pull the airplane around to the right. The, uh, the rudder wasn't much good uh, when taxiing on the water for steering. This other side is pretty much the same. We have the vertical stabilizer up here with uh, the air rudder. And on the back of the air rudder you see an collision light. The elevators up here, which is part of the uh, horizontal stabilizer. That's uh, what we control pitch with, and then the, the rudder here is for controlling yaw. Um, that, this side is pretty much the same as the other side. There's an escape hatch right here. This uh, panel here can be opened on the inside and pushed out, and then we can deplane if need be. And we have the same type of landing gear situation on this side, the way it pulls into the, uh, the hull there. The, the Grumman Goose, which I am more familiar with, had a different type of landing gear. It's more like on the, uh, the Grumman Wildcat, where the gear was pulled up into the, near the nose, and it had a tail landing gear. Whereas this one here is a tricycle landing gear aircraft. And with that tail landing gear, that meant that getting into the plane was a little bit easier as well. Because this one, you, you need to get stairs right. sometimes. Right. Uh, well, when uh, getting on the aircraft on the land, when, uh, it, when this airplane and the goose were sitting in the water, the door was about at the same position on the, uh, the docks. But on the land, yes, this, this plane is very difficult, very hard to get into. We have a similar pontoon on this side. Again, here's a uh, opening where we could have put uh, the gas filling uh, cover in there. Underneath the wing over on this side, there's a light up under the, uh, the wing. That is the landing light. A lot of people ask me, well, how is that going to be of any value while this airplane is trying to land at night? Because it would be shining straight down. Well, when we turn on the switch to turn this light on, it folds out and it's pointing forward. That way we have, the, it's just like the headlights on an aircraft car or uh, an automobile. This uh, tube that's sitting out, sticking out of the wing at the tip there, that's the pitot tube for which we get uh, information on airspeed and such in the aircraft. And this, the paint job on this thing is really unique because uh, the, the person that owned it, Mr. LaFont, was very, very concerned about the way the aircraft looked. About every 100 hours, a uh, commercial aircraft has to be 
thoroughly inspected. And there are a lot of panels on here. You can see the panels underneath the engine. There's panels all along here that have to be taken off so that uh, they can inspect the cables and tubing and stuff like that inside. And when everything was put back on, if there was a chip on any one of the, the rivets or the screws or bolts on here, it would have to be repainted, just that area. So it's always looking as smooth and as beautiful as it does right now. Should we go check out the inside? That would probably be a nice idea because I'm finished with the outside. <laughs> <laughs>